The one thing I said I didn't want to do was talk about a series loss to the A's on Monday, and now it's Monday, and we're going to talk about a series loss to the A's. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, April 8th, 2024. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on MLB and use code all lowercase locked on MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. All righty. Well, they did it. They lost the series to the Oakland A's at home in the first home series of the season. Obviously, we're going to talk a lot about what went wrong because that is mostly what happened. Uh, they scored one total run between Saturday and Sunday combined against the Oakland Athletics. I want to start off by asking a question. How many road series do you think the Oakland A's will win this year? How, how many, you know? There's one. There's one under the belt. Boom. First, first couple of weeks of April, Oakland A's already got a road series win. How many do you think they're going to, to get? Just road. Not that they're going to get very many series wins, period. How many do you think? It's not going to be a lot. And the Detroit Tigers just begged them to do so. And they did because they're still... A Major League Baseball team, believe it or not, even if their owner doesn't want them to be, and they're going to play at a Triple A stadium next year. So let's start off by talking about what went wrong because that's a much longer list than what went right. This was an absolute disaster offensively. And that is, we're not bearing the lead. We're not, you know, pushing anything around. I'm not trying to get it misconstrued. The offense is absolutely the biggest talking point, the elephant in the room, and the biggest cause for concern surrounding this baseball team, albeit nine games into the season. It was dreadful this weekend. I think the concern is absolutely valid from people. Now, again, as much as you can make fun and make jokes, like Parker Meadows isn't going to have an 87 average and a, and a 450 OPS. But there is no guarantee that that OPS is over 700, right? There's no guarantee it's over 680. And that's where the cause for concern comes from with a lineup that is full of young, unproven talent. And it's seven games. Or nine games, rather. Sorry. Said it before. We'll continue saying it. It's, it's April 8th. Okay, we got a lot of baseball, a lot of baseball. That is the silver lining surrounding this entire conversation that everyone should remember and that I continue to remind myself as well. But that doesn't mean that the complaints and the and, and the concern that you do have is just thrown out the window and not justified just because it's early. That just means that we have more baseball to see. We have to wait and see how valid it ends up being. You haven't been scoring, I mean, we've played three teams now, right? And you haven't been scoring against the A's, the White Sox, and the Mets. Two of those three teams might legitimately be the two worst teams in baseball. There is an argument that those teams will be 30 and 29. And the Mets aren't good. So the that then drags in because it's early in the season and we're coming off the offseason. That drags in the offseason mentality and the mindset of let's just have the, the young core continue to grow type of thing, not bring in a ton of outside help. Torkelson, 184 with a 462 OPS and is a pop-out machine 
at the moment. His swing looks completely out of whack. What is the MLB record for pop-out percentage in a season by someone who like actually plays every day? You know, like a full season pop-out rate for a hitter. Because I, I tweeted out as a joke, I was like, we might be witnessing history. Now again, it's seven, nine games in. I don't know why I keep saying seven. We're nine games into the season. Obviously, some of that will find its level. But pop-out machine. Like I said, 462 OPS. Riley Green, drawing some walks, and when he does hit the ball, he's hitting some homers. So his OPS is above league average. However, 188 batting average. Parker Meadows, we already talked about. 087 average, 450 OPS. That was your leadoff hitter for Sunday's game and a majority of your season so far. We can just play the OPS game, our favorite game here in my tenure of Locked On Tigers since 2021. Our favorite game, OPS of the lineup on Sunday. No names attached. It's in order, so you can figure it out yourself, obviously. I'm not trying to hide anything, but 450 OPS, 502, the OPS of uh, Andy Abanez, who pinch hit. I just said I wasn't going to attach names to it. Forgive me. Uh, 785, 462, 747, 634, 563, 853, 800, 734, 794. Your bottom four have been significantly better than the top and heart of your lineup. A much smaller sample size, nine games, regurgitated information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but Carson Kelly legitimately has been at least getting on base, and that's why he keeps finding himself in the lineup. During a, a start to the season in which this offense has just been abysmal. Like I said, it's the elephant in the room. The second half of last season, they improved objectively. They scored more runs than they did in the first half. Their their offensive standings climbed, right? But as a whole last year, it wasn't good. 2022 was the worst thing I've ever seen offensively. And in the offseason, you brought in Mark Canna, and he's been clearly your best hitter at the moment. Clearly. Dude's getting on base left and right, showing some pop. Right, the only guy taking consistent professional at bats in this lineup right now is Mark Canna. Gio Urshela has looked pretty solid too. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But you know, when we acquired Mark Canna back in whatever that was, that October even October November, we had talked about on here. We had said, you know, I really like this acquisition. I love the pickup. I love I I love bringing in Mark Canna. I think he's going to make the lineup better. But if Mark Canna is the best bat you bring in this offseason, or if Mark Canna is your best hitter, then you have a significant problem. If Mark Canna is your best hitter throughout this season, then this offense is going to be brutal. I'm not saying that that's going to be true. I understand it's April 8th, and I think everyone should understand it's April 8th. But the reason why the offense has been brutal so far is because he has been your best hitter. You went 0 for 12 with runners in scoring position and had 16 lob. That was just in the last two games of the series when you scored one total run in 18 innings. One run, 0 for 12 with runners in scoring position and 16 runners left on base as a team. Absolutely brutal, devastating, horrific, terrible. Pick an adjective. We can just play that game. Let me know the adjective you would use to describe the Tigers' offense. That can be a fun exercise for everybody. Really, really, really brutal. And the clutch hitting has been a thing for as long as I've been here, for sure. Torkelson has never hit well with Ron as a scoring position his entire Major League career. Riley Green. Has not hit well with runners in scoring position his entire major league career. The entire team last year, outside of Javi Baez, oddly enough, doesn't make the contract worth it. Not trying to hype up Javi. Everybody calm down. I, <laughs> Jace. 
It's been rough. Okay? So the offense stays horrific. Good. We didn't bury the lead. We got that out of the way now. Let's talk about the rest of the weekend, everything else. Uh, again, that it's only one point, but it's a lot of people. It's everybody. Everybody involved with the offense. Brutal. Um, there's a, obviously a few other things that went wrong this weekend. Uh, we will talk about all of those right after this. Going to talk to you all today about our friends over at Prize Picks. Spring training is over and baseball season is officially underway. Don't miss your chance to add your favorite players from the diamond in your prize pick entries. Whether it's strikeouts, RBIs, or first inning runs, take your pick of more or less and add them to your prize picks entry today. You can get in on all the playoff action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks. As you and the world's best players take on the game and take the game to a whole new level, especially during basketball's postseason that is right around the corner, April 20th, uh, playing around a few days before that. A lot of fun coming your way via prize picks when the playoffs start. There's a lot of fun, obviously, again, with baseball season. Really cool to just look at the starting pitching matchups. It's one of my favorite things to do in the morning. Part of my routine, you just look at more or less on strikeouts, innings pitch. They have fantasy points even that a player will score. Uh, and, and taking a look at all the pitching matchups, it's a good way to uh, to do it. So download the app today and use code MLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, that's code MLB, all one word, for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow talking about game one against the Pittsburgh Pirates. Hopefully some offense can get going. Also be sure to check out Locked on Sports today, the 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube or in the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. So we've... I think exhausted the offense conversation uh, for now, at least. Obviously, if it continues, we will continue having the conversation. But it's gotten off to a, a really, really, really rough start. And you're going to need somebody, anybody, to catch fire. Um, but the thing that was the most frustrating about Sunday's game was that they were working the count. And they were, you know, drew a few walks, especially early in the game. Like, the, you know what I mean? It wasn't like they were just going, like in 2022, they just went up there and just everything was a ground ball to shortstop or a rollover to second or a pop out. And it was just the most uncompetitive at bats I've ever seen. They were working the count. And, and, and like I said, I, they, they drew three walks, most of them early, only struck out six times via Boyle. Um, like they, 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 the approach in a vacuum was not some abysmal thing. The execution was horrible. And Boyle had more balls thrown than strikes in that outing. Just inexcusable. Completely inexcusable. I love drawing walks, and that's something that that I've always been very, very vocal about since taking over here. I think that a hitter that draws walks and a team that that draws walks is that that is that should be uh, a focal point. Um, but it doesn't matter if you like are spitting on balls out of the zone and doing all that good stuff. If when the ball is in the strike zone, you don't have the ability to do damage with it, then it all becomes for naught. It, it is irrelevant, genuinely irrelevant. So it's it, that is that is the key. <laughs> I'm, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but that is the the whole thing. That that is the key point here. When they do throw the ball in the zone on a 3-1 count, 2-1 count, 2-2 count, full count, whatever, you have to be able to take advantage. And, and the Tigers so far this year just absolutely haven't. Um, Jack Flaherty, something else that 
did not go very well this weekend. Unfortunately, six innings pitched, nine hits, six earned runs, one walk, five strikeouts on the one home run against. Fastball command was absolutely brutal on Sunday. Uh, and, you know, that's something that in his first start we talked about as well. Now, really kind of brushed it under the rug. Didn't really, uh, you know, get all over him because of it. That's not because is not the right word about it. Right. We, we weren't I didn't rag on him for it because he still had a good outing uh, at the end of the day. Didn't allow very many runs. Good. But it was the White Sox. Now, today was the athletics. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and and that's I guess my point is that if you don't have good fastball command, you know fastballs that catch the heart of the plate. And his velo was right back to what it averaged last year. It was ninety three, a little just a hair over ninety three miles an hour. You know we didn't see a huge velo tick uh, or uptick from you know comparing and contrasting the fastball velo to last year to this year. So you need you need. Fastball command. And Jack Flaherty so far as a Detroit Tiger has just not had it. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. The slider I didn't think was bad. The secondary stuff I, I thought he was offering was was pretty solid. But it, it doesn't matter if he has a 93-mile-an-hour fastball with no command. None of that's going to matter. So it's start two, and one of them he was able to overcome it and still have a good outing. We'll see what the future holds. But that is why. He struggled on Sunday, April 7th. Okay. Let's talk about what went right. They obviously did win a ball game on Friday. There was some good to take out of the weekend, despite the fact that everybody is kind of doom and gloom and, and not happy with the performance over the weekend, clearly myself included, and obviously rightfully so. Uh, the bullpen only gave up two runs the entire weekend. Fantastic. Continues to be absolute nails. Uh, Foley continues to look like an absolute rock star as well. As far as players offensively that I thought actually kind of stepped up and, and put together some good ABs, had some good games. We talked a little bit earlier. Mark Canna has gotten off to a pretty solid start this season. Gio Urshela as well has looked pretty good in the box. I think you're going to see him play probably a lot more, especially if the offense just continues to suck. Uh, so yeah, I'm Mark Canna on base machine. Gio Urshela puts the ball in play Two very different mindsets. Both of them gotten off to pretty solid starts. Obviously Gio Urshela had the big double the opposite way in Friday's game to break that tie and get the lead. Um, like that's man, like, yeah, the, the offense, the offense, the offense, the offense, not looking great. Carson Kelly on Saturday. Fantastic. Uh, I believe he went over on Sunday, but uh, that you're, I, there's a reason why you're seeing Carson Kelly out there fairly often. Uh, and, and AJ Hinch alluded to it in spring and a lot of our beat writers kind of talked about it as spring training was coming to an end, the, the true kind of tandem and, and not as much a ready lefty pl platoon or a one, a one B situation. And, uh, if Carson Kelly continues to hit consistently, he's going to keep finding his way into the lineup. Because Jake Rogers is really a three true outcome kind of guy that strikes out a boatload. Nothing inherently terribly wrong with that. Um, we know that he can provide value uh, given his approach and everything. But uh, if Carson Kelly shows up offensively this season, then he's going to get a lot more playing time than maybe we ri originally anticipated. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for what went right, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, again, the bullpen, really solid. I mean, we can go player by player. Uh, uh, Joey Wentz, the fastball continues to just be his Achilles heel. So uh, only gave up the one run. But uh, yeah, every time he threw the fastball, it was made contact with it, was put in play. It wasn't a very effective pitch. But the other stuff, the cutter was looked really good, I thought. I didn't think that he looked terrible. Uh, Fiedo needs to get more swings and misses. Didn't look terrible, though, on Sunday. Andrew Chafin, Jason Foley, everybody who was involved out of the pen on Friday looked really solid. Um, yeah, two thumbs up for, for the bullpen, and uh, that was definitely the biggest thing. If you want to point to one thing that went wrong, offense as a whole, everybody involved, one thing that went right unit-wise, bullpen, pretty much everybody involved there. So uh, let's talk about other stuff, our favorite segment. Just other stuff, not necessarily really good or really bad, just noteworthy things from the weekend. We will talk about all of that right after this. 
Going to talk to you all today about our friends over at Game Time. Game Time absolutely rocks and is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier than it already was. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and the lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. You can save up to 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. Save even more with exclusive in app deals on select seats ahead of the game or the event. They also have zone deals, so you can choose the section and game time will choose the seats for more savings. They also, my favorite thing, they have the game time guarantee where your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. And for a limited time, all users can get $20 off of any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with code first pitch. That's first pitch, all one word, for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. So get in on the action and download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Third and final segment of Locked on Tigers. Appreciate you all for tuning in as always, despite the frustrating weekend from the Cats. Uh, let's talk about other stuff that happened this weekend. Tarek Skubal started on Friday. Don't think he. it's really fair to put him in the super what went well category because I think it was a little bit of a letdown final line, but he certainly wasn't awful either. Six and a third, four hits, four earned runs, two walks, nine strikeouts, two of the four hits obviously being the home runs against. Very frustrated when he got pulled from the game, rightfully so. He had no business giving up four earned runs to this lineup. Uh, none. And there are actually some pieces in that A's lineup that aren't catastrophically awful. And, you know, whether I'm not trying to play apologists, they should have probably swept this team. They certainly should have won the series. This is not, this is a separate thought. Okay. It, it, I'm, I'm separating uh, my Tigers brain from my rest of the league brain. Okay. So I, there, there are some pieces in that A's lineup that aren't terrible, but that Scoobal absolutely still should have done better than he did. Obviously, the two home runs, just mistakes. Look, really what happened was he was cruising through four. He was spectacular. And then the command fell off the table, and it fell off the table hard. He had a four-pitch walk to start off, was that the, the fifth? And his fastball command just never really came back. Uh, one of the home runs, at least one of the home runs, off of a heater. Um, just couldn't find his spots nearly as well as he could in the first three or four innings of the game. And then the long ball, something that he has talked about in that, honestly, he has kind of struggled with his entire major league career, uh, kind of was his Achilles heel in this start as well. So not worried about him, like uh, not not trying to, again, if I was worried about him, I would have put him in things that went wrong. Uh, not worried about him, just really not a great outing. And it's it's a luxury to look at that and go, wow, he could have been way, way better. Because, again, that, that's one run away from a quality start in the uh, in the statistician's eyes at the end of the day. Kenta Maeda, I think, falls under stuff. Uh, another guy, he was an out away from a quality start. Five and two-thirds, two hits, three earned runs, four walks, three strikeouts. Obviously, the big home run against for him as well, against him as well. First two innings were brutal, really brutal. Command was absolutely all over the place. The velo is still way down, almost two miles an hour slower year to year on the fastball specifically. Once he got a feel of his splitter and he was commanding that pitch well, uh, his outing improved dramatically. And he still had the low velo on the fastball, but the fastball was actually decently effective despite the low velo because he had a splitter to pair with it. That Those two pitches are, are so reliant on each other for their effectiveness. Uh, splitter is good if you can throw your fastball for strikes and command it well. Uh, that is pretty much like the only reason that, that a splitter works. So uh, that'll be how the season goes for him. If he can get back to 90 miles an hour, nonetheless 91 at some point, 
and the fastball control and command is fine and the splitter is decent, then he'll have a decent year. And if he can't, then he won't have a decent year. That splitter is kind of the whole point of everything. So uh, he recovered nicely. It was not nearly as bad of an outing as people, A, thought it was going to be, or B, maybe thought it was. Uh, he actually settled in pretty nicely after those first two innings were behind him. And the big reason for that was splitter command. Uh, Javi not playing on Sunday. He's already had a couple of games off and we're only not even double digit games into the season. Uh, I think that's probably a sign that they're not going to take just completely awful production from him throughout the whole year, just because they have to. Now he's still going to start. Uh, I'm not telling you he's going to get like permanently benched or ride the pine or be a utility player. He is still going to play much more than he won't. Uh, but I do think that there is, I mean, at the end of the day, he's your seven or eight hitter. And AJ Hinch has no problem playing matchups or platooning his seven or eight hitter. So I, I think that that's probably the mindset there. Rough day in the organization really all around Sunday was. <laughs> Sunday Sunday just sucked. That <laughs> just was the worst. Unless you're a hockey fan and the Wings got a big win. But uh, just really, really blue. Ryan Kreidler hitting the hand this weekend. Not great. Eddie's Leonard removed from the game. Tweaked something. Sir Gibson Long started a rehab assignment. That's good news. Uh, Job, Jackson Job, command all over the place, was loading the bases. I think in two different innings he loaded the bases. Just just rough. Just rough, rough, rough organization day Sunday was. So uh, short memory, right? Put it behind us, move forward. At the end of the day, the team is 6-3. and three. And uh, I'm not trying to make it sound like the sky is falling. I'm I'm... I am not trying to be sky is falling guy nine games into an 162 game season in which they're three games over 500. Okay. Um, but they, they will not win games if the offense doesn't improve. They, they will not continue to do what they did in Chicago and New York where they were just squeaking out wins, one run, extra innings, whatever. That is not sustainable. It's not kind of sustainable. It's not almost sustainable. It's not sustainable in any capacity, with how poor the offense has been so far. So I'm glad that they're winning. That is good. That makes this not as, I don't want to say not as big of a deal because it is the same amount of deal no matter what their record is because the offensive production has been the offensive production. But it, it, it cushions the blow. It, it makes it much more manageable. It makes it so that you have the ability to recover. If you go on and you win Monday, you're 7-3. and three. That's pretty darn good. <laughs> Right, that's that's a pretty darn good start to the year. If if you if you march in there on uh, uh, today as you're listening to this, and you start off with a win, so I'm not trying to be season is over. Like I, I I try to stay out of that, especially in April, the first half of April, no less. Okay, we're still very early on in this thing, um, but I, I am not gonna get in anybody's way who is concerned about this offense because I think that that's very fair. And when we talked about going into the season. This team, the whole thing, right? The, the the theme that I picked out for this season was it was the year of the what if. And that was because the difference between what the, the best version of this team and the worst version of this team are very wide apart, very wide apart. And so that is the uh that is is why there is concern, and that's why it's understandable. So um, you play the Pirates. You got a two-game set against Pittsburgh here today and tomorrow. They are eight and two. I feel like every year they crush in April and then fall off the face of the earth and are under 500 by the end of the season. Um, but it is still April, so you're going to get a, a good Pirates team so far. Uh, game one is going to be Reese Olsen versus Mitch Keller. Keller has given up four earned runs in each of his first two starts this season. Not a ton of swings and misses. From Keller, he's more of a uh, uh, pitch to contact, ground ball, weak fly out type of guy. But he's a fine pitcher, man. Like this guy's going to have an ERA between like 3 8 and 4 2, be a back end of the rotation caliber pitcher, you know, somewhere on a four ERA, like I said. And uh, he's going to get his strikeouts too, but um, he, not a big swing and miss guy. You'll be, you should be able to put the ball in play. Go, go put up some runs against Mitch Keller. Again, four earned runs in each of his first two starts. He has not gotten off to a good start this season. 
Then game two is Casey Mize versus Martin Perez. Uh, Perez doesn't get strikeouts. Like, at all. A at all. He fills up the strike zone, tries to get ground balls, uh, a lot of in-play baseball, okay? Sinker baller. Sinker changeup cutter as well, but, you know, throws the, the sinker 40, 45% of the time, has for a while, no strikeouts. Now, he's only given up three total runs in his first two outings combined. So, gotten off to a pretty decent start this season, but two guys who should be able to put the ball in play in and have an opportunity to do damage against. Will that happen? Who knows? Hasn't happened really much so far this year. But again, at the end of the day, you are six and three. You have a chance to be seven and three today. And I think if you would have asked all of us, or would you take a six and three start, even just no matter what happens on Monday, I think most of us would have taken it. That all being said, you have to turn the offense around or else this is going to get really ugly really quickly. Thanks for making Locked On Tigers your first listen every single day. Shout out to the everydayers that do tune in every day. We will be back tomorrow talking about game one against the Pirates. Um, yeah, I mean, if this is uh, if this is going to be prolonged and, and this is a, a theme that's going to happen this year offensively, then, then I'm going to get way more upset as the season goes along and uh, – and, and <laughs> I'm not really looking forward to that, so I hope that they turn it around. But at the end of the day, got to keep it in perspective. It's early. It just sucks. It just sucks. So make some adjustments. Turn it around. We'll see what happens. Peace and love. Going to therapy's dope. I'll catch you all tomorrow, baby. Go Tigers.